Hi, this is Roger. Thanks for dropping by. A bit different today. Very rare occurrence. I feel lousy today. I have managed to get up and have a couple of coffees and I'm just... Um, I'll probably go back to bed or sleep on the settee. Just feeling like low. No energy. Um, however, I can stand here and waffle onto a camera. But yeah, I just feel lousy today. If I've got that dreaded lurby, there'll be trouble. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Uh, if I have, tough. You know, managed, I've had three close encounters and escaped so far. Maybe this is my turn. So be it. Right, new, the big news this week is the probate documents arrived. Um, <clears throat> so the transfer document is with my sister. That's got to be signed and witnessed by all four of us four independent witnesses. So that one's doing the rounds and that's for the land registry. That transfers the name on the deeds from my mum to us as executors. <laughs> In a couple of weeks time they'll have to do it again to transfer it from us to the guy who's bought it. <laughs> or the couple that's bought it. Um, yeah, that's legal stuff, they can get on with that. Um, I spoke to the people about mum's shares because I haven't been able to do anything about that without the probate documents and um, they emailed through the appropriate forms to sell the shares by post providing we've got the appropriate documentation which we now have so those forms have got to be signed by all of us so that, that lot's with my sister doing the rounds <coughs> <coughs> she hasn't been well <laughs> uh, and she's going on holiday to Portugal on Wednesday my other sister's away in another part of the UK on holiday and I believe is due back either late yesterday or today and there's this little window at the beginning of next week where hopefully everything will be signed and then get it back to me basically then it can be all sent off so that's good news um, that's that what else is going on um, I've my big to show Joe maple that I desperately said I no, I said desperately needs repotting. I didn't desperately say it. You know what I mean. Um, I've missed the chance. The leaves are far too open now for me to repot that. So, is that Mojo having a grizzle again? Um, so what I did to the other bonsai in the last bonsai video, just scrape the tops away so that I can water better, get rid of the weeds and give it a trim is all I'm going to be able to do with that one. However, I am still going to repot my pine and I am going to repot my little um, Zelkova, my little twin trunk because the pot's completely broken and the water just runs out. I can't water that properly and the pine hasn't been done for a very long time. So we've still got some actual bonsai repots to do. Um, neither of those are in a hurry. Um, one hasn't even, the buds haven't even started to move. Zelkovas open their leaves very late. They're late to go into autumn as well. Um, and the pine, a good time is as the buds start to move and with pines, that's normally in April sometimes, so I haven't missed my chance there. We also have to do a, a collection of the, bon the potential bonsai that I found in the wild. I've still got to go and get that, which um, the clocks have changed now, that makes a difference. <laughs> so I will get that done hopefully during this week, because that's not, that's not a daytime thing, so don't ask, I can't film it. I know my camera films in low light, but not in the dark, and I need my hands free for when I fall over and trip and break my neck. <laughs> Going through heathland and rough ground in the dark in your wellies. Must be mad. Uh, and I need to feel better than I do now for, for me to attempt that. So today I'm going to cheat. I'm not going to do direct orchid stuff today. What I'm going to do today, which is why... Oh, I can't, I can't even turn the camera any sense. <laughs> I'll pick it up. That is here. That is here for a reason. I'm going to do what I'll call part one, because it's going to take longer than uh, one video. The answers to the questions and answers that you all nicely put in. So what I've done on the laptop, Firstly, brought it out here and put it on its stand. 
This laptop, that's the largest stand I could get for a laptop or a projector. And my laptop just fits it. But the mains lead doesn't. The mains lead's halfway down the side, so there's nowhere for it to escape, so it's resting on the mains lead. <sighs> Nothing's ever right, is it? No, no, not perfect, just always slightly off. But what I've done is selected the Q's and A's video and brought up the comments. So now the only comments I'm looking at are the ones under that video. And YouTube won't play ball. I was expecting to be able to click on something and hang on, what have we got over here? I was going to say I've missed something. This is not very easy using my mouse on the laptop. Oh, this is not easy. Right, we've done it, I think. What I'm trying to do is, there were two options, top comments and newest first. Well, I want oldest first, but I haven't got that as an option. But if I go to newest first, then the oldest ones are at the bottom, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> and then we throw the mouse on the floor. Oh, it's just not with it today. Right, so I'm now at the bottom of the list, which is the oldest ones, which it says 10 days ago, 9 days ago, 9 days ago. See how things slip. 10 days ago. I only wanted to wait 4 or 5 days before I did the answers to that video. A lot of people will have put questions in and forgotten them. So we'll read them out. And over here, we have my little kitchen timer because there's no way I'm going to get through all of these. So I'm going to set that to 30 minutes. It'll make a horrible noise when it goes off, but so be it. And that's how long I'm going to do. And then hopefully tomorrow I'll finish it off as a separate video. So uh, let's get going. 30 minutes we got on top of what was there before. Right. <laughs> and the first question is from Insa. And it says, I think I'll sit this one out. <laughs> That's not a question, it's a statement. Uh, so no question for me, sir. Uh, let me get in close, I don't want to keep leaning all the time. Let's switch that around. Uh, right, That's somewhere near it? That'll do. Right, the next one is from Julie um, Soane, I think that is. Or it could be Soane. Uh, anyway, S-O-A-N-E. Um, these are channel names, not people names, mind you. I don't necessarily know people names. Hi Roger, do you keep any records of your orchids or do you just keep information on the plant labels? I don't keep anything on the plant labels except the plant name. And that's when it's got a label in the first place. Why haven't we got labels on them all? Because I'm a lazy git uh, and I am getting round to it. Uh, so yes, I keep records. I keep the genus in a cot. Uh, it's a spreadsheet, so the genus is there so that they can be in sets. So all the dendrobiums are together, all the yeah, oncidiums are together, etc. Then the plant name, and then I've got uh, a column that says um, the start date and end date of blooming. That will also say in bud if it's in bloom. And it will say in bloom, in bright blue, if it's actually currently in bloom, with the date it came into bloom, and an open date ready to put the end of the blooming in, which then becomes the history. I keep um, the date that I acquired it, where I got it from, the date it was either repotted or mounted, and some notes on the end about that repotting or mounting, were the roots any good, what did I pot it in, that sort of thing. And then I keep a column which is updated when I water. And it basically, against the plant, it will say the date it was last watered and what it was watered with. Yeah, like, you know, <laughs> um, date, TDS 150, CalMag to 190, pH 6.4. That's the sort of information I keep each time I water. Um, so yes, I keep notes and um, I update them when I do something. Not every day. I probably do something every day, but not to every plant. Right, so that's that. 
How do you, oh, and this one's from Anna Dacchioni, that's D apostrophe, French, um, A double C I O N E. <laughs> How do you clean the, the leaves on the orchids, seeing as they are never rained on? Or even is it necessary to clean them? Well, let's put it this way. I don't. <laughs> um, there are some plants that arrive that have got residual on the leaves from chemical sprays from nurseries and things like that. I would normally clean that off because I don't know what it is. But I've never found a need to clean leaves except on one occasion. If it's going to a show, the leaves need to be clean. And I just use RO water and a, a cotton wool pad and <clears throat> not freezing cold water. So I very rarely clean the leaves. Um, I mean, my plants do occasionally get sprayed in the summer where they'll get absolutely soaked, but that might not happen this year. But that used to happen when it was hot. You know, I used to use it to help with humidity and cool the plants down. I don't think we'll be getting that hot this year, so probably not. Right, next one, Andrea Allen. Or orchids, oh, that's going to be your orchids in the kitchen window. How often do you have to water or feed and fertilise? Um, more frequently than anything out here, because their night temperatures don't drop as low as they do out here. Yeah, so they, they stay a little bit warmer in the kitchen, which is, they are Phalaenopsis after all, that's good for them. Um, they get watered and or fed, depend, quite honestly, if I've got anything out here that's getting fed, then they will. Yeah, because <laughs> they're higher feeders than a lot of stuff out here, so I take advantage, like if I'm doing my mounts and they're on a feed run, then I'll go out and water the fowls because I've got some feed on the go. Yeah, so that. So they don't get flushed anywhere near as often as some of the things out here, but they still get a flush every now and again. And that, I suppose they're getting watered at the moment about every three, four days, something like that. But basically I don't use calendars and things for watering. It's when they're dry, basically. I let them almost get totally dry. They're probably not totally dry because some of them have got um, cocoa husk as part of their um, mix. I mean, one of them's in cocoa husk. And that Although that might look dry on the top and round the outside of the clear pot, it's not. In the middle there's still moisture. Yeah? So the last thing to dry is the centre of the pot. Yeah. So uh, yeah, every three, four days, something like that. Now that might get a bit more frequent when the natural temperatures rise. The day lengths are getting longer all the time. Yeah? So they'll use more water up in the daylight hours. So a bit more frequent perhaps. Now I've got to fiddle with this uh, mouse again. Right, so who was that? That was that one. Let's get that one down to the bottom. Next one. Tina Sachs, S-A-C-H-S. -S. Good morning. I like the idea. Although I've never been good at asking questions around. <laughs> but here's a question. Um, it's been on my mind for a while. How is Mr. Harry doing? Is he still around? Well, yeah, un <laughs> inadvertently, there was an update on that in a very recent video. Um, the actual main plant has been thrown away. I'm left with a very small plant, which I can just about reach, which has no green on it, but it could still potentially shoot out. That's all that's left of Mr. Harry. If that fails to shoot out, then I will get another one, because it's a plant I want in this grow room. And I'm determined to get one to get up to the level of plant I once had, somehow, if possible. Maybe. <laughs> Next one we've got uh, Aka Petrovic. I'm pronouncing that literally, that's probably not right. Um, out of all the Oncidinae that you grow, which one do you find is the most reliable bloomer and which one is the easiest to grow? Um, there's no one answer to that. Quite honestly, the, the Oncidium Alliance varies because of what it is. Pure Oncidiums, species and um, hybrids, are pretty easy to grow. They're pretty tolerant. Some of them are cooler growers. Most of them would be intermediate. 
Some of them do like high humidity, some of them will put up without it. But when you talk about the Oncidium Alliance, you start bringing in others that are less easy depending on your conditions. I've always said there's no such thing as a difficult orchid. What is difficult is creating the environment that it likes. It's not the orchid's fault that it likes that. Um, so you've got the awkward ones used to be for me, maybe not so much now, were the Miltoniopsis. They're cloud forest dwellers. They stay cool, they need airflow, they don't need high light, and they need to stay moist. And the most important thing with them is that maximum temperature needs to stay down. Yeah? Um, and some airflow. They like a buoyant atmosphere. If you, if you walk into a place and it feels a bit jungly, oh, a bit warm in here, isn't it? You know, whew, you know, <laughs> that's not right for them. You're more likely to be, if you walk in and sort of go, oh, I think I'll put a jumper on. That's more like what they want. <laughs> So you've got those. Then you've got the odontoglossum types that were reclassified into oncidiums. Again, cool growers. They're like a buoyant atmosphere. They don't like to get warm. So in the Oncidium Alliance, there are variables. But where I grow here, the only variables I can do really are light. Because this whole place gets the same. You know, if the heater comes on, it doesn't heat that corner, it heats the whole place with the fans coming on. So I have to have an average, yeah? And this year I am hoping that that's going to be a lot better for my cooler growers, like the Miltoniopsis and the Odont types. Um, uh, see, you could say Shari Baby's one of the easiest, but I've had trouble with it. I'm hoping that my latest version, which I've got a feeling is a i got a feeling it might be a 2N or a 4N even, because I have never seen a Shari Bailey looking like that before. It's an absolute stonker, the size of those bulbs. And that's how I got it. Um, I mean, I'm growing new growths now. This one's pushing on nicely. It's got another one here. There's more than one plant in here. So both of the plants have new growths, and this one's pushing on strong. I'd expect one of these to bloom. Come on, you heard me. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I've had trouble growing that in the past. The Nelly Islas are notoriously awkward. And again, it's because they like to stay cool. And if you can't do that, um, when I say cool growers, uh, what we're talking about now, unless you've got an unheated room in your house, it's gonna to be too warm. Because if you're comfortable, they're not. It's too warm for them. They prefer less heat than that. Most people are comfortable at 21, 23 degrees centigrade-ish. That's their comfort zone. They might like it a bit warmer than that when they're sitting down in the evening. Some people don't like it as warm as that, but that would be their absolute maximum for them to be really comfortable and really grow vigorously. Because they can. They've got the right conditions. They'll take off. So, um, uh, I can't say an easiest one because they vary so much. Brassiers, again, the Oncidium Alliance, they're pretty easy going. They'll tolerate some heat. They don't mind the night temperatures going down a bit. They don't need the high humidity. They're pretty tolerant, but then they grow into big plants and they can have spikes two meters long. Have you got room? <laughs> So there's no one answer to that, I'm afraid. Um, right, next one. How's time going? <laughs> We're doing all right. If I can finish these, I'll be over the moon, because then we can start again in a, in a few days' time. Next one is from Ninitech62. Strange name some people come up with. <laughs> I'm sure there's some perfect logic there. Um, I know you've discussed the different major types of dendrobiums before, but I was wondering which group the Australian dendrobiums fit into. Um, I don't know specifically, because I've not, I was just going to say I haven't got any, but I have. I've got um, Delicatum, which is a, a Kingianum cross with something by Jibum, I think. Something like that, anyway. Um, but it's, it's a primary cross that actually occurs in the wild. Um, 
Danny Carton. And I think that's the only Aussie one I've got. I do have one called Aussie Sweetness, but that's, that's a nobly type. That's <laughs> just its name. Um, you, the cross may have actually been created in Australia, I don't know. Um, so I don't really know much about them. I'm afraid when it comes to orchids, I learn about, research and get to know orchids that I'm either about to get or have got. So if I haven't got them, I'll know next to nothing. And I'm afraid that's the way it is, like, you know, like the catacetums. I don't like them, I haven't got any, so I don't know anything about them apart from they like some form of dormancy and they're awkward if you water them at the wrong time, but I've only picked that up from other people's um, comments, really, not my own. Right, so that was, where have we got to? There, right, so another page. Right, we've now got Ian with a small eye. Hello Roger, did you ever have a problem with magnesium deficiency? Yes and no. Um, my feed that I use, the MSU fertiliser, has all the magnesium in it that any of my orchids should need. But, it has all the other elements in it that they should need. But, there's always a but, you've got two buts. <laughs> but, 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 but. At the end of the day, those nutrients can only be absorbed and utilised by the plant at certain pH values, yeah? Now, if I constantly fed my orchids with a pH that was not conducive to absorbing magnesium, I would have a deficiency. Self-created, basically. But under normal circumstances, I vary my pH, which is the factor. It's not the fertiliser, it's the pH that will govern whether all of that fertiliser can be used. And the chances are there is no one pH value that will utilise all of those to their maximum at any one time. Which is why I vary the pH. Yeah, so I tend to aim at around 6.4, 6.5, 6.6 generally speaking, and most nutrients will be relatively happy absorbed at that value. But there are some that are almost shut out. Now, it's mainly the little ones, the itty bitty ones. So every now and again, I drop down to sort of 5.96 and do a run at that level. And that gives, it gives the others a chance, if you see what I mean. But yeah, it's not the, not the feed in my case, it's the um, pH that will dictate its uh, utilisation. Now I did have a problem last year where I tried a bit brighter, got rid of some shade netting, not all of it, <laughs> not, not with the sun full on the thing, um, and a good friend of mine who grows very good plants, where this came from, um, just left me a comment under one of my videos, Roger your oncidiums are getting too much light, and I hadn't noticed they'd gradually got pale. And I, so I had a look around and I thought, oof, flipping heck, you're right. We've got, we got, you know, very pale green leaves here, in some cases bordering on yellow. So they had a massive dose, one off, of magnesium, which really, really gets the chlorophyll going, which is where your colour green comes from. So that was a one off. So that's that. Perhaps Sones or Somis, um, S-O-N-E-S. Please can you explain the name changes in the Oncidium Alliance? I haven't got a comfy chair and I haven't got three days, so no. <laughs> Simple answer. Um, uh, the thing is, they do keep changing. I mean, you've got Bialara, Alisara, um, uh, Brassada. There's just so many. Um, Miltonidium, it just goes on and on. And the problem with them is, is that as the genus involved, or genera involved in the intergenerics, get reclassified, then the name doesn't work anymore. So as fast as you get to know these, the chances are they're not true anymore. So I don't bother too much. If I buy something that's got Alisara, or Alisara, however you want to say it, on the tag, then that's what I'm just going to put in my notes. 
I'm not going to try and look up the elements that went into it and do a historical view and try and get back to the species and then work out whether they've been reclassified or not. I can't be bothered. But um, I have found on the internet some very good lists of all of the Oncidium Alliance intergeneric names and what's in them. And then you'd have to decide for yourself how up to date that list is and is the list of what's in them actually accurate? Because if you think at the base level it's an Oncidium Alliance, there are some true Oncidiums that have been reclassified. So they're no longer called Oncidiums. Sweet sugar springs to mind. It's not Oncidium anymore, strictly speaking. It is in my notes though. <laughs> So that's that one. Mike Kinseth. I'm pretty new here within the last year. Welcome. Um, which orchid have you had the longest? Um, I don't know without digging out my notes quite honestly and my notes got lost. I had a laptop crash and um, basically my notes were lost and they were reconstituted with the help of um, somebody who managed to, <laughs> managed to get an image and get the data off the in image with a clever bit of software. And we managed to recreate some of my notes. So, uh, but no, I mean the the old. Um, you, I would only be able to go back to when I started doing those notes anyway, because I don't put dates on tags. And I've had orchids longer than that, so I don't really know. But in my notes, there are orchids that have got 2014 on them. But that's probably when I started making notes, rather than when I started collecting orchids. So I don't really know. I've just forgotten. It's just too long ago. <laughs> and what got me into this amazing hobby? Stupidity. Craziness. Um, certifiability. <laughs> I've had orchids around the house since I was at college, which is many, many years ago. Um, I had an orchid on my windowsill at college. So they've been around the house always. I've always loved the blooms and so they've just always been there, but not really as a proper hobby. You know, that started about, I don't know, 12 years ago, maybe 15, I don't know. I lose track. It's called getting old. <laughs> right, that's that one. Let's see if I can scroll up again. Some more down. There's my time doing. Going on, right, Wonder Shaw. Two questions. Cheating. <laughs> the thing is, if I, if I say I want everybody to limit themselves to one question, you can come back in two days' time and put another one in, can't you? So I'd never win. Right. Um, have you ever a spike? Have you ever had a spike? I suspect that means. Have you ever had a spike just stop growing mid length, but the leaves and roots continue to grow? It's one of my hybrid fowls. Um, I have had some Oncidium spikes abort. Um, you have to bear in mind I don't grow many fowls and I've, um, only in relatively recent times have I got some in so that I can have some house orchids to do as a separate project. It's not something I grow so I don't have a lot of experience. You know, If I had 50 fowls maybe I would have come across that before but personally no I haven't come across that before. Um, but I have had Oncidium spikes abort, um, I've had Cattleya spikes abort, Dendrobiums I've had bud blast, I don't think I've had a whole spike drop, and bear in mind a lot of Dendrobiums don't really have a spike do they? Um, they have buds coming out of the cane, you know, it's not quite the same thing. But no, I haven't really had that to any extent so I don't really know. Question two, I was wondering how your Miltoniopsis is coming along and if you think you may acquire any more. Well, my Miltoniopsis are a bit special. Um, one is a gift, two a gift, no one. The other one was the Vasa Vixella, or however you pronounce it. <laughs> Which last time I watered, I forgot, because it's on a shelf on its own. Oh, I it drooped. It's the first orchid I've seen for a long time that actually drooped. I had to stand it in some water and watch it come up again. Oh, I could have lost that. It's a, it's a plant that likes to stay damp sort of thing. So, uh, um, yeah, so my Miltoniopsis, there are 
There were six species, there's now five, one's declared extinct, it's gone. I think it's in cultivation, but it's gone from the wild. And out of those five, I've got three of them, so I'm quite pleased with my collection. I also have a primary cross that is... I've, I've moved them all, they were here. So they were on a high shelf, which is a waste of high shelf. I need height for tall plants. So they're now over behind some other plants on a half size shelf which means I can't get at them. But I do have one spike on my Miltoniopsis Venus, which is a primary cross. Um, and that's got, I think it's got three, maybe four buds on it. And all the others that I've got, apart from the two that are left that came from our 60th show a few years ago, which were a bad lot, I have two of those left that are just about hanging on. They don't look good. My Ordinary hybrid, that you know, the sort of store-bought type thing that you can get, is pushing on strong. That's doing really well. It's got a good root system. And I think it's currently got four new growths. It's about time that put a spike up as well. And my other species are doing okay. I'm hoping for some blooms possibly later this year. So would I get any more Miltoniopsis? Yes. If I see the other species, <laughs> one of the other two species, I'll grab it. I will be interrogating Sarah next time I go to Burnham's. It's flying lesson day, Sunday. So it's when people aren't working, are they? So this is a lot of people, it's the only chance they get to go and have a lesson if that's what they're doing. And that sounds like one of those sorts. Why don't you come a bit lower, mate? Take the chimney off. Right, so the next one is Tom Belcher. Could you give us an update on your 2021 Feeding Miltonias project results? That's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I, that, that project fizzled out, basically. What I had was that uh, it's, uh, it was two of these big ones up here, this one and this one. Um, vigorous plants, and um, at the start of the season, they both had the same number of new growths. And to all intents and purposes, despite being a different hybrid, they looked almost identical. And that's difficult in the world of collecting orchids. So I have two plants that are different, that actually look the same and have the same number of growths at the same stage, is almost impossible. So I thought, right, we can play with these. And the idea was that one of them got fed with all my other pots on the regular run, and the other one got a much higher feed. Each time they were fed, one got normal, whatever that was, and it varied, and the other one got like twice as much. And I pushed that on until they bloomed. Um, they both bloomed well on those new growths. Um, the trouble is, unless I repeat it for several years, you can't really say that the one that had more feed had a better blooming. It had two or three more blooms on the spikes because they weren't the same plant effectively, even though they were both Miltonius. But um, I would, <coughs> I can safely say that the difference between the two plants, if there was any, was not a lot. My theory as a result of there not being a lot of difference was that I was wasting my time and my feed and my money because I was probably overfeeding and leaving quite a lot of that feed res residual in the pot to be flushed out next time round or whatever. So I didn't see a noticeable difference. But bear in mind they weren't the same plant. That was a, not a scientific experiment. It's a bit of fun basically. So uh, no noticeable difference. Uh, orchids at heart, spelled H-A-R-T, which effectively is Male or female deer? Female deer, I think. If you're talking about this one, it needs an E in it. Um, well, I suppose it could be spelled differently in different countries, I don't know. Would you consider buying some hardy orchids to plant out in your new garden? No. <laughs> Most of them I don't like. <laughs> um, examples were um, uh, Cypripedalums, um, Calanthes, uh, Latilias, I think that is. Um, not really, um, because I don't want to be a gardener, and slugs love them, you know, you, and 
If you get a harsh winter, you're liable to lose some without putting some straw down. I don't want to be bothering with what's outside when I've got all this inside. And as I said, the um, most of the hardy slipper orchids, I, I just I don't, don't even like the look of them, quite honestly. They look like bubble gum. But, um, yeah, no, simple answer is I, I don't plan on going to. I have a hardy orchid in a pot out there, which ought to be poking out through the top of the soil soon, if it's still alive. There's about five spikes come on that each year, and it's a, a variety of southern marsh orchid. I don't know what the Latin name is without going and looking it up, but it's the leopard variety, so it has spotty leaves. But that's the only hardy orchid I've got, and it's the only one I really want. Um, you know, so not really, not going down that road. Right, where's my mouse gone? Making a cat whining again. Right, now we've got some um, Camilla Carey, or Carrie. Are you still going to do anything with the water rain barrel for orchids or are you happy with the RO water? Yes and yes. <laughs> yes, I'm happy with the RO water. I got a new um, tap connector uh, so there's now no leaks and you know I still get the waste water that is expected but not all the leaking water as well. So I've now got a good flow out of the RO unit so I will carry on using that in the main. But I do want to get the, the um, water barrel sorted. There's no point in doing that until this roof's cleaned off. And there's a little gadget you can get that you can put in a rain barrel. Once it's clean, it's no good point putting it in there if it's dirty and manky, but it will keep it clean. And it's a little piece of industrial silver that you drop in that apparently lasts forever. And several orchid growers that I know use it and have said it's successful and it's about 10 quid on eBay. So yes, I will sort the water barrel out, but that's not a high priority at the moment, but it would be ideal for watering my bonsai and like my hardy orchid that should have rainwater really. Um, so I will get round to it. It will be done one day. Right, next one. How's the time going? You're out of time. <laughs> Well, let me have a look at the video time, which is more important. Yeah, I'll just do one more, and then I'll I'll make a note of the break-off point, and um, we'll start again, possibly tomorrow or the day after, with the rest of the um, with the rest of the questions. God, thumping headache. Um, right, last one then for today is Rock Doc two one seven four. Apart from changing the media and spraying the roots and the rest of the plant heavily with hydrogen peroxide, is there anything else you would do if you found a slug or snail on the plant? Flamethrower? <laughs> <laughs> the trouble is, if you've got a greenhouse or a conservatory which is open to the elements, you're going to get them. They're going to find ways of getting in. You know, I mean, a slug can get, in, get through the keyhole on a lock, you know. So you're going to get them now and again, whether you like it or not. Now, the hydrogen peroxide will fry slugs and snails, um, but I'm not sure it's capable of destroying any eggs that might be in the media, so that, you know, they would still hatch out. But um, I don't... If I find a slug, I just kill it, basically. But if I think I've got quite a few, and at the other place I did get a point where there were enough around to bother, um, rather than just an odd, you know, put your thumb on that one sort of thing, because you've seen it. Um, I found that um, after you've watered a plant, so let the water drain, so the plant media is damp, just put a few slug pellets on there. The slug pellets don't seem to work if the media is dry because the slugs are going to avoid that pot because it's dry and they like to stay damp and cool. And you could also, depending on what gets in your grow space, put some around in the corners on the floor. If you have pets or kids, I wouldn't recommend doing that. They are poisonous after all. And I also don't like using them out in the garden either. So um, I have used them in my grow space because there's only me goes in there and I know they're there. So, you know, but yeah, there isn't much else you can do quite honestly. There are some liquid 
slug killers that you can get, although I've got a feeling that's been taken off the market. I had some of that and I gave it to Lynn because she's got a much bigger problem than me. And you basically mix it up and you water it through the plant, yeah? And it's supposed to do the job. But I never tried it, quite honestly. I bought it and I never got round to using it. I gave it to Lynn. She has a much bigger problem than I do. You know, she's she, she's losing sets of buds off of Mazda Valleys and Draculas. That, you know, that plant's come into bloom for the first time for ages and ages, and the buds are wiped off. So, you know, it's a serious problem for Lynn. So, whether, whether she tried it and whether it works or not, I don't know. That I don't know. Right, that will do for those. And as I said, I'll pick that up. Um, how many have we got left? One, two, three... Lots. So I don't even think we're halfway. <laughs> but if I dedicate another video to I mean, some of them are short answers. Some of them need an explanation. That's, that's how it goes with the questions and answers. But I can't start a new set until I've dealt with these, obviously. And I suspect the next set will be a lot less. Because, you know, most people haven't got loads of questions. They might have a few. And they've done them. You see what I mean? So uh, hopefully we'll... Uh, Get another set on the go. Uh, we'll get the rest of these answers done first and then we'll get another set on the go. Um, right, so I've got no, no shows or anything coming up now for some time. Um, what I do have though is a talk next Saturday. The Wessex Orchid Society meeting next Saturday, which is also a committee meeting. So it's, going to, it's just going to be one of those days I'm probably not going to enjoy that much because we've got the committee meeting itself and then immediately that finishes I've got to go and like sit on the door for people who want to come in and pay their subs um, we're doing the tickets the cheap Orchid Society tickets to get into Malvern in June people want to come up and pay for that so I'm, I'm stuck there and then I've got to get straight up and do a talk you know and that talk I haven't even started yet. Um, the talk I was going to do Dendrobiums through the seasons, I, I need now, plus some past clips which I've been putting to one side, now coming into bloom, coming into growth, through into, well into this growing season, I need those clips to do that talk properly. Um, and the talk was supposed to be in September, which would have been great, but it got moved. I had to swap with somebody else who couldn't do April, and we wanted them to do the talk. So they got my September slot, and I got their April slot. So I've changed the name, and the talk I'm going to do on Saturday, which I will post on YouTube when I've done it, so that you can proofread my text and stuff. When I do pop-ups in a video, you can't proof, you can't use a spell checker, it's a video clip. You can't get at it. So what I usually do is post it on YouTube and get you eagle-eyed people to tell me when I've made spelling mistakes or you know, things like that on the text bits. Um, and I'm going to do the... What did I call it in the end? Oh. You know, I'm going to take some of this in a minute. I don't normally get bad headaches, but uh, this is, uh, it's getting across my eyes now. Um, that's probably because of the noise level, because I'm talking out here, which is echoey. I go and sit quiet, it might go away. Um, it is the, <coughs> the compromises we make in growing orchids. Um, so that might, might sound a strange title, but my plan is to start off by saying, have a look at these pictures and think about what they've got in common. And then I'm going to show pictures of places where tropical orchids grow. Cloud forests, mountain sides, you know, jungles, swampy areas. Yeah? The idea being that um, that's where they grow and you can't have any of that on your kitchen windowsill, can you? So you're going to have to make compromises and then move through the sort of compromises you might need to make and how you can get round them to get as close as possible to suitable environments as well as choosing suitable orchids for the environment you've got. So I think that'll make an interesting talk. I should be able to get enough in there to please everybody but 
but I do a talk for an orchid society. I'm probably one of the only speakers they get who doesn't forget the people who grow in the home. It's important to me that they get remembered and mentioned because a lot do. Even those that have got automated greenhouses, they've still got some plants in the house probably. And some people have only got their orchids in the home and they get forgotten. So we will include something about what you can do, different types of window sills, unheated room, heated room, <laughs> artificial lighting, artificial uh, humidity. You can go to town in the house just because it's a house. If you, if you start including lighting and humidity, you can turn a room in your home into something like this. It won't be natural light, but the LED lights nowadays are as flipping close as you can get. So, uh, yeah, well that's, that'll be the plan. To do something like that, which I can knock up with clip, clips and stills from the internet and um, talking bits, you know, so uh, we shall see. And I'll get it posted onto YouTube so that you can have a look and I can make any amendments prior to Saturday. And we shall see how we go. <coughs> oh, I just, just wanted to show you this ah, before I disappear. Jenkins the Eye is just opening. It's not open properly yet, but it's just, just coming into bloom. <laughs> and it's blooming in the bit that it didn't bloom in at all last year. Because last year, in the winter, that end of the plant was in the shade. And so we had no buds up this end. And so all of the growths at that end didn't bloom, so they are this year. This end that bloomed its head off last year hasn't got so many buds. <laughs> so it's definitely light triggers the blooms on that one. Definitely. <laughs> Most of the time you can say, you know, this is what I think happens, but on that one I can say definitely what happens because I've seen it. <laughs> seen it for real. So uh, there we go. I haven't got anything new apart from that. My papstia will be open shortly. And I'd say probably well over two-thirds of my dendrobiums have actually got buds. Some are pushing on. But most of them have got buds. So uh, we will have lots of things coming into bloom as, as the uh, season progresses. Yeah, good stuff. And I can be gathering video clips to do with the dendrobiums and stuff as they sort of come into growth. And, how they change their appearance and their care, you know, seasonal care for dendrobiums does vary quite a bit and it varies depending on the type of dendrobium. Some of them vary a lot more than others, so should be a good talk when that one's put together. Right then, I'm going to pack away and go and sit in the, uh, <laughs> in the place where there's less bright light <laughs> and um, see if I can get rid of this headache and oh, I don't know, just achy. I'm going to get some out, I'm going to get a flipping cold or something. <laughs> I can feel it coming on. And thanks for dropping by, I'll see you next time. I shall do my normal Sunday thing at this point, if you're still here. Um, if you haven't subscribed, it would be nice if you did. Don't forget the old thumbs up or down if you didn't like the video. Uh, what do you mean you didn't like the video? I know where you live. <laughs> and also those that support the channel in other ways, like the buy me a coffee and the, um, um, the patron, Patreon site, so the patrons that have stayed with that, and a few new ones that have joined. Thanks, thanks for the support, it's all good stuff. You've got the merchandise store continuously there, that just ticks over. I've got no plans on making major changes to that, that, that that's what there is basically. Um, I don't plan on changing much. And um, yeah, thanks for watching. <laughs> Probably the most important bit out of all of that, is thanks for watching. Enjoy your company and leaving your comments. It's all good stuff and I'll see you next time. Thanks for dropping by. <laughs>